great many balls and entertainments. Even our military gentlemen are too liberal to make any distinction between Whig and Tory ladies. If they make any, it is in favor of the latter. It originates at headquarters. I must tell you that Cupid has given our little General Arnold a more mortal wound than all the hosts of Britain could. Miss Peggy Shippen is the fair one. I've taken my pen in hand to write you, and as often has my trembling hand refused to obey the dictates of my heart, a heart which has often been calm and serene amidst all the din and horrors of the war, trembles with diffidence when it attempts to address you. Dear Peggy, suffer that heavenly bosom to expand with a sensation more tender, more soft than friendship. Miss Shippen is 20. He is lame and 38. She is a Tory. It takes money to move in Tory circles. An insatiable thirst for riches seems to have got the best of every order of man. Party disputes and private quarrels are the great business of the day. A dinner or supper may cost three or four hundred pounds, but a great part of the officers of the army are sinking into beggary. I need not add that I am alarmed. Arnold sells requisition supplies at tremendous profit. I strictly charge that you keep even from your closest acquaintance that the writer was concerned in that purchase. But graft cannot be hidden. An angry citizen writes to the newspaper, when I think of the splendor in which you revel, and compare those things with the decent frugality used by other officers in the army, it is impossible to avoid the question from whence these riches flow. As the war commenced, I was in easy circumstances and stood a fair chance of improving them. I sacrificed my ease and happiness to the service of the country, and in her service, I sacrificed a great part of a personal fortune. Pennsylvania authorities charge Arnold with graft. Arnold flees to Washington. Let me beg you, sir, to consider that a set of artful and principled men in office may misrepresent the most innocent act and by raising a public clamor, place your excellency in the same disagreeable situation I am in. He self-invited some civility I never meant to show him or any officer under arrest and he received a rebuke. Arnold writes to Peggy. I am treated with the greatest politeness by General Washington and the officers of the army who badly execrate the council for their villainous attempts to injure me. I daily discover so much baseness and ingratitude among mankind that I almost blush of being of the same species and could quit the stage without regret not for some dear, sweet, generous soul like my Peggy, who alone heard, felt, and seen, possess my every thought, fill every sense, pant in every vein. If your excellency thinks me criminal, for heaven's sakes, let me be tried, and if found guilty, executed. Congress has stamped ingratitude as a current coin. I have nothing left but the little reputation I have gained in the army. Delay in the present case is worse than death. I beg you to be convinced I do not indulge in any sentiments unfavorable to you. While my duty obliges me, and I'm sure you would wish me to avoid even the semblance of partiality, I cautiously suspend every judgment till the result of a fair and full trial shall determine the merits of the prosecution. Awaiting the court-martial, Arnold marries his Peggy.
Joseph Stansbury, a Philadelphia Tory, is ushered into Major Andre's office. General Arnold sent for me, and after some general conversation, communicated to me under a solemn obligation of secrecy his intention of offering his service to the British forces in any way that would destroy the usurped authority of Congress, either by immediately joining the British Army or cooperating on some concerted plan with Sir Henry Clinton. We meet Arnold's overtures with full reliance. He expects to be indemnified for any loss he may sustain in case of detection, and that 10,000 pounds shall be engaged in police services. Not even Arnold's greatest personal enemies suspect him of treason. And his friend Washington writes him. You will be pleased to put this in hands whose secrecy can be relied upon. The importance of this business will sufficiently impress you with the need of transacting it with every possible degree of caution. Arnold replies to Washington. I will observe the utmost caution and secrecy. But to the British. I have received a proclamation from the commander in chief the purport of which will be transmitted to you. However, the British can secure such information from less expensive spies. Accept a command. Be surprised. Be cut off. These things may happen in the course of a maneuver, nor you be censored nor suspected. A complete service of this nature, involving a corps of five or six thousand men, would be rewarded with twice as many thousand guineas. About five hundred thousand dollars. Eight months after he began negotiations with the enemy, Arnold's court-martial for graft and profiteering convenes. You will indulge me, gentlemen. Well, I lay before you some honorable testimony which the Commander-in-Chief of the Army of the United States and Congress have been pleased to give my conduct. Is it probable that after having received the favorable opinion of those whose favorable opinion it is an honor to receive, I should all at once sink into a course of conduct equally unworthy of the patriot and the soldier? If this is true, I stand confessed in the presence of this honorable court, the vilest of men. The blood I have spent in defense of my country will be insufficient to obliterate the stain. I have looked forward to this present day when I shall, I doubt not, stand honorably acquitted by my fellow soldiers of all charges brought against me and share with them again the glory and danger of this just war. Only the most minor of Arnold's drafting activities were proved. The court-martial sentenced him to be reprimanded by Washington. The Commander-in-Chief would have been much happier in an occasion of bestowing commendation upon an officer who has rendered such distinguished services to his country as Major General Arnold. But in the present case, uh, a sense of duty and a regard to candor oblige him to declare that he considers his conduct in the instance of the permit as particularly reprehensible and in the affair of the wagons, imprudent and improper.